good morning uh, all our viewers uh, tuning in today welcome to investinguruindia.com on behalf of the team i am nirav hemani welcoming you to this special series of webinars with cios today we have with us uh, mr rahul singh of uh, tata mutual fund he heads the investment team at tata mutual fund with respect to equities and he has been in the industry for more than 25 years experience in research managing funds and of course leading the investment team at tata mutual fund take a moment to welcome you rahul to our show thank you thank you rahul uh, there is a top a uh, burning question on the top of a uh, lot of investors and time and again uh, you know investors uh, seeing the markets and the economy have this question on the top of their mind equity markets have recovered smartly uh from the lows of uh, april and march and similarly the commodity prices like gold and silver have also rallied on the other hand the global gdp uh, picture paints a very grim outlook and expectedly uh, most of the companies who have posted their quarterly results for q1 fy20 have uh, posted a decline in growth a decline in revenue and expectedly so that was uh, expected given this backdrop how are you reading this sharp divergence in the macro data and the share price movement that we are currently seeing yeah i think uh, you're right the markets have uh, defied gravity and have defied fundamentals uh, at least the near term fundamentals so i think uh, let us try and break it down into why the markets have gone up and try and understand where the risks are today uh, in terms of if there is any further downside uh so i think the uh, i think first we have to understand that equity markets or uh, uh, generally tend to look ahead uh, they are not backward looking they are uh, forward looking uh, and in march and april when there was a correction uh, there was uncertainty and therefore markets you know factored everything in very very dramatically uh, just to give you an idea the earnings forecast for nifty 50 companies went down by 30% for this current year and about 15 20% for the next financial year so all of that was factored in very very dramatically and very quickly uh, of course in the us market there was also panic so all that added to uh, the correction but as i said i think the markets look forward and not backward uh, so as we entered june and july i think what was becoming clearer is that covid is going to stay with us um the economy will get used to it people will get used to it probably will take a longer time to recover but it was clear that either through medication uh, because despite the infection rate what you would have seen is the uh, the fatality rate is still very low so i think uh, somewhere that uh, i won't say comfort but somewhere that uh, gave uh, some relief to the medical system and to to the economy to start coming back Uh, that is number one number two is that the uh, that the uh, interest rates when they come down globally as well as in india uh, then you see basically uh, a, a more fund flow towards equities because if you don't can't make money in on the debt market side you will try and invest more and more into equities so that also leads to equity valuations going up so that's number two number 3 and uh, the most important factor is that in india when we entered june july we realized that there are companies and there are sectors which are still doing well um you know you had sectors like telecoms specialty chemicals pharma uh, even some parts of consumption like packaged foods uh, and e-commerce which were doing well and doing much better than pre covid so i think that became a big realization that uh, an it services i forgot about it services that it services also started to do uh, fairly well so clearly um, it was uh, a case of markets also realizing that uh, yes the banks might feel the pain but there are three or four or five sectors which are also doing better uh, the other thing other related thing to this is that what happened in july was that the profit estimates which were getting cut till then uh, stopped getting cut because you know as i said some of the sectors did well like uh, it services and pharma and these are big sectors secondly a lot of companies 
which had basically uh, seen significant cut in the top line did not see a big cut in their profit estimates because they also cut costs so they protected their profit margins much better than what the market was expecting so combination of these four five factors really explains this rally uh, still i think from a current valuation perspective one would think that india is uh, trading at uh, a valuation p multiple entire country is trading at a p multiple of say 20 21 times one year forward earnings and 18 times fiscal year 22 so it is not a cheap cheap valuations anymore uh, we are in the fair valuation zone and uh, our valuation premium to other emerging markets is back to 40% which is again in the fair valuation zone so i would think that um, the markets look like more in the fair valuation zone uh, and and not in a significantly overvalued zone if uh, you know if 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 uh, uh, if if that if this kind of a background is taken into account right right and, and just a quick follow up uh, you partly answered uh, the question uh, but what in your opinion will the shape of the economic recovery will be uh, will it be v shape l shape u shape and you said a slightly elongated one yeah so i think there is no one simple answer there are different sectors uh, uh, which are benefiting or not or getting impacted differently so i say uh, you know the 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 best word or the best alphabet which i have heard which explains this recovery is the k shaped recovery so there are some businesses which have dropped and which will remain here for long time so maybe hotels hospitality maybe aviation uh, there are some businesses which have after covid have shot through so whether it is e commerce you know telecom uh, pharma as i said parts of it services where you know the companies are making uh corporates more digitally enabled so it spending is going up so there are some companies which have actually gone through gone like this they have never they never had a dip also um and the third category is is the u shaped which parts of the uh, which becomes the part of the k where you see a sh- you, you see a decline and you take a longer time to recover which is where bulk of the uh, market would fall under which is the consumption stock the stationary consumption Uh, even banks and financial services would fall in that category so you have a segment which has gone down and stay there you have a segment which actually improved immediately post covid and there is a segment which is going to take a longer time to recover so you have three legs so that's why we call it the k shaped recovery uh, and uh, and the point i'm trying to give you this difference is because you know there is not one single pace of recovery for all the sectors and as fund managers our job is to find out the sectors which are earlier in recovery and and wait for the right time to buy sectors or stocks which are a little later in the recovery i think that that is a you know a very quick kind of summary of uh, how we see the recovery happening sure 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 uh in in the last uh, decade or so uh, there has been a tremendous reforms in india by way of implementation of gst rera corporate tax cuts and india has also had a fair share of disruptions with the npfc crisis the covid related lockdowns uh, during such times historically we have seen a consolidation of the market share at the hands of the large organized players uh of course uh, this is all at the expense of the smaller or unorganized players getting beaten down do you read this consolidation across sectors as a structural theme or more transient in nature going forward uh no i think uh, it's a structural thing in nature because uh, you know the larger companies and the more well funded companies will tend to become stronger in the current scenario uh because of the way the funding might be restricted to the not so strong balance sheets or not so strong business models uh so to that extent uh, you know i think from a balance sheet perspective your theory is right i think where the opportunity is for smaller players is because uh, you know business models are getting disrupted for example in consumption the traditional distribution model is getting disrupted so if you can adapt your business model to the new e-commerce digital way of transact transacting with the consumers uh, you can fight this shortcoming of size uh, so size obviously gives you balance sheet advantage funding advantage in times like this 
but the agility part uh, is is much better in the smaller and mid cap companies and smaller cap companies and therefore what we are seeing is that you know uh, we are seeing that some of the uh, mid cap companies the small cap companies and some of the, some of the sectors which i mentioned like pharma chemicals electronic manufacturing uh, which is becoming a big theme uh, given that capacities are shifting from china some of these companies have been able to shift and take advantage of these uh, uh, opportunities much much better than uh, the large cap uh, companies or the let's say the large companies so uh, therefore i would not think that it is uniform yes large companies do have an advantage but where they lose out is the uh, the agility to take advantage of the changing business models right 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 uh, interesting point that you made and also in the opening remarks uh, you mentioned that the average pe of india uh, is around 2021% uh, that uh, brings me to my next question uh, while markets have always been uh, polarized in the nature last 2 to 3 years we have seen top 10 stocks contributing bulk of the returns in a headline index like uh, sensex or a nifty uh, do you see broader markets also recovering uh, from here on given the low base effect and part two of the question is uh, does quality mid caps and small caps look attractive uh, from a beaten down valuation perspective currently yeah i think broader markets uh, in the short term when i say short term it's mostly six months um, maybe in the fair value zone so plus minus 5% uh, you know that kind of uh, range bound movement you should expect um yeah, the risk is uh, from a correction which emanates out of us and if us market corrects then we could get a sharper correction of say 10% but i would say that the broader market the uh, let's say the uh, index level market will remain range bound and uh, like i was saying a lot of new emerging sectors and new emerging themes are now um uh, finding more space in the mid and small cap space we don't find the same amount of opportunity in the large cap space barring one or two companies which have done great work on the digital side so uh, my own sense is that it is reasonable small cap valuations are even more reasonable uh, so to that extent at least i am not worried about buying a mid cap and small cap you know traditionally in a time like this you would be worried about buying mid cap small cap but today when we are uh, looking at mid cap and small cap stocks we are not looking at them very differently from how we are looking large caps we are actually looking at the themes and the segments where these mid cap small caps are so if you are in a let's say electronic manufacturing space or a chemical space or a e-commerce space small cap i think the opportunity can be huge if you are um if you if the management execution is solid and if the balance sheet is reasonably decent um so we are indifferent of the market cap today uh, we don't see any big sign of either undervaluation or overvaluation in mid cap we see it as a perfect um, kind of scenario for uh, bottom up stock selection and therefore uh, in our view uh, you know i think uh, mid cap small cap not just quality mid cap small cap but more in terms of thematics which are the segments which are going to do well i think that is what one should be focusing on right right, right. Uh, as a fund house uh, you have always been a bottom up uh, stock research house and you have always uh, drilled down on a stock specific uh, uh, a company and then invested into it uh, from a uh, if we just zoom out a little bit and if you say uh, which top 3 sectors or themes that you are currently focusing on given the covid related uh, pandemic uh, and the lockdowns that uh, subsequent uh, what do you think uh, going forward could be the top 3 sectors as a beneficiary of the current pandemic times oh clearly like i mentioned uh, telecom is out, out, out there uh we also like pharma space although the the sector has done very well in the last 6 months so it might take a pause of uh, maybe 2 3 months but over the next 12 18 months there are uh, a lot of triggers and a lot of uh, things in the pipeline which makes me uh, makes us still positive on pharma uh, so telecom pharma uh, i think it services will have a steady uh, kind of uh, growth period for next 2 years because as corporate start spending more and more on digital transformation i think our companies are well placed uh, we don't expect significantly higher growth for it services 
but even a 2 3% 4% higher growth rate than what is their normal growth rate uh, can give us that delta so these are two three sectors we are focusing on and then and then you come to the other sectors which are like i, I was talking about in the mid cap and small cap space um, mostly in the pharma and in the uh, chemical space the e-commerce space electronic manufacturing space and so on. right right uh an interesting uh you know thesis uh, over a period of time we have heard uh, from the market participants is that the narrative of, uh, of india is its strong consumption uh, domestic story uh, and it will drive the bulk of the gdp growth uh, we have seen some supply side disruptions due to lockdown and the pandemic uh, but that has eased out significantly over the past few months uh do you see the revived uh, demand uh, already in place from the non discretionary and the discretionary consumable side uh yes i think discretionary uh, we are seeing decent sign of revival in autos for example uh, i think white goods uh, is still lagging but autos have been seeing good recovery you know i think the recovery will have two parts uh, one is the additional need for and the other one is uh, uh the ability to do it so um, in terms of ability while it is still challenged there is need to buy a personal mobility vehicle and that is why you are seeing additional demand in uh, in autos and two wheelers and cars uh, in entry level cars so we are not seeing uh, demand in the luxury cars or in the uh, higher end bikes but you know more entry level bikes and, and cars Uh, so clearly we are seeing that uh, we saw a decent recovery in the rural markets in uh, you know in in tractors and and so on in any case over the last 2 3 months we are also seeing on the fmcg side the rural markets doing better than urban markets so whichever has a more rural base i think is generally tending to do better uh, the other segment in the non discretionary side which is the fmcg side which has done exceedingly well and i think that is where the food habits uh, or the consumer habits have changed is on the packaged food side so while packaged foods was always talked about as the growth segment i think what covid has done is to give it a, a huge uh, boost and uh, we are seeing all packaged food companies uh, doing extremely well in the last 4 uh, 5 months and in fact even in the first quarter uh, if you look at even till june quarter some of the packaged food companies did not i mean they actually grew significantly over last year while the other other fmcg companies uh, uh, did not grow so clearly uh, there are you know there are these small small trends within the within the broader sectors right and, and a quick follow up uh, to the question uh, do you see uh, this as a pent up demand because 3 uh, 4 months people were locked down in their homes and naturally uh, the uh, demand actually got just deferred probably the demand was never disrupted that way so do you see this as a pent up demand for next uh, maybe 2 3 months or a quarter or a couple of quarters or you see this as uh, you know uh, maybe a structural change maybe people have uh, uh, altered their consumer uh, habits and how they consume uh, uh, you know something like autos or something like uh, fmcg that you mentioned the packaged foods piece yeah no it's always difficult to say that but i mm-hmm. can say that uh, a lot of the demand increase uh, is due to the structural factors also because today uh, pent up demand is not really a big driver i mean if someone does not need to buy uh, a car or a two wheeler because the incomes have also been impacted he's not going out there and buying if he doesn't feel the need to do it so i think there is a there is a decent structural element to some of these uh, uh, new trends which we are seeing um, especially for example in packaged foods i think that trend is uh, is is much more visible so i think uh, the uh the drivers of these demand will have to then analyzed on a product by product basis uh there is obviously a pent up demand in some of the areas for example you know organized retail maybe in fashion retail in those purchases there could be a pent up demand one can agree to that but uh for high ticket items like bikes and all pent up demand is not the only driver uh definitely there are structural drivers to uh to those uh, you know to those production to those segments 
Okay, okay. Uh, we've talked about India uh, in, at large. Uh, what about uh, international markets? Uh, uh, U.S., uh, uh, you know, there, there are data sh showing that uh, uh, ten-year bond yield is at its lowest. Uh, uh, oil is, uh, you know, at its probably historic lows, 50, 60 percent drawdown. Uh, how do you see the international markets uh, reviving uh, from a perspective of an Indian average investor looking at international equities within uh, the basket of the overall asset allocation mix? Yeah, right. I I would be. Uh slightly more cautious of international equities at this point of time because uh, as I was saying, I think in the US market specifically because I think that is where most of the uh, attention is and most of the investments are going. Obviously, these big tech companies are solid companies, so they've obviously done well. Uh, but there are elements of that market which uh, are uh, uh, driven by technical factors and not only the fundamental factors. I think the first leg of the rally till June or July was more driven by uh, you know the fundamental factors because we could actually see some of these e-commerce companies like Amazon, etc., gaining. But post that, I think what has happened is that uh, there is a lot of uh, liquidity-driven rally which has taken over. A uh, lot of it is also on account of uh, you know the technical factors like what's happening in the derivative market, in the options market, and so on. So I would be a little careful. I would tend to, you know, stagger my investments into international markets, uh, especially if it's on the tech side over a longer period of time, let's say six, eight months, uh, because, um, you know, to, to enter the markets at these levels uh, may not be uh, very safe. Uh, it, it is looking like uh, uh, having higher risk today than, than the Indian markets. Okay, okay. Fair point uh, that you made. Uh, you know, over the last uh, uh, few years, uh, we have seen financials as a sector uh, going through its own fair, of, fair share of challenges. And uh, talking about consolidation, financials as a space is probably one of the most diversified uh, space where uh, on the banking side you have the large PSUs uh, dominating the market share. Of course, the private sector uh, banks have come of age and eaten up the market share. On the NBFC side, there are probably 10,000 odd NBFCs uh, in the market. Uh, on the uh, other side, then you have the non-lenders and uh, etc. Uh, my question is, uh, on the financial space, uh, since it is a backbone of the economy and probably you cannot do without a financials as a sector doing well if you want to have a, a good GDP growth, uh, how do you see uh, challenges in terms of uh, the uh, uh, NPAs rising probably in a couple of quarters from now or maybe year down? And uh, second, is the consolidation also in the offing uh, for the financials as a sector? So I think consolidation is happening indirectly in any case because if the companies are, uh, if the smaller companies are facing challenges either to raise deposits or raise funding, uh, the companies which are large, which large deposit franchise, like the large private sector banks or maybe the large PSU banks, they are anyway gaining market share. I think what is happening in uh, banking is that there is huge amount of uncertainty uh, as to what will happen when the accounts come out of moratorium. And unlike a manufacturing company or a consumer company, uh, when you have a bad month or a bad quarter, you know at that point of time that, okay, this is a bad quarter and you put it behind you. But in a financial or in a bank, uh, what happens is when you have a bad quarter or two for the economy, and this happened during demonetization also, the, you come to know of the impact six months later or nine months later. I think that is a big difference between how uh, financials show up the pain versus how uh, you know the normal manufacturing company shows up the pain. And that period of uncertainty is never good for any equity. Uh, so whenever a stock or a sector goes through a period of uncertainty, whether it's three months, six months, nine months, in this case, the uncertainty could continue for six to nine months. So, um, so therefore, during that period, uh, obviously, the banks which have raised money, I mean, we have seen a lot of banks raising capital. So they have raised enough money to keep lending and, and keep protecting against uh, any kind of credit cost or write-offs and the bad loans. So I'm not worried about some of the large banks and large private sector banks. Uh, but as a sector, yes, it will. It is going through a period of uncertainty. Uh, I think lending will be on the on on uh, on the lower priority, 
except for a couple of banks, I think uh, uh, banks would prefer not to lend aggressively and therefore that will also put a cap on consumption and how fast the recovery can happen. Uh, but that's a cost to pay. I mean, we have had a, the most significant disruption in an entire century in, in our economic scenario. So um, if we have to live with six to nine months, 12 months of uncertainty on financials because of that, I think that's a very small cost to pay. Uh, the good news is that, you know, I was reading somewhere that India has raised uh, almost uh, $33 billion in fresh issues. Uh, most of it has gone to banks and most of it is through the QIP route. So banks have also raised a lot of money to protect against any major uh, down cycle on the NPLs. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, clearly there is stress, clearly there is going to be uncertainty on financials. Uh, but given that most of these banks have raised money, uh, I am not so worried about its second order impact on the economy. Okay. So, uh, an interesting data point uh, which just got uh, released from AMFI, uh, uh, the industry flow numbers basically uh, of August 2020. And I'm talking from a perspective of uh, uh, probably March 2016 onwards, uh, we had, uh, you know, net net positive equity flows into the uh, mutual fund industry. Uh, uh, of course, the numbers uh, don't look as bad, but they are surely negative uh, to uh, to about minus four thousand crore, uh, you know, net equity flows. How do you read uh, uh, the uh, you know the numbers? Do you see a trend unfolding here? Probably just investors want to take money off the table uh, in in the current crisis times. Yeah, I think uh, the retail behavior has been to uh, to book profits. In the, uh, in the rallies, especially since June. And I think there's nothing wrong in that because the economy is still going to go through an uncertain phase. Um, so I think it's a healthy uh, uh, kind of uh, healthy uh, data points to suggest that uh, the uh, retail wants to book some profits and later on come back or maybe come back in a staggered manner. So I don't worry about it too much. Uh, as I said, I think the, there are bigger things to worry about in terms of the economy and the banking sector and how uh, and when we come out of this uh, uh, you know, economic uh, depression. So, so therefore, uh, money will flow back as and when we you know, come, come through that period. Um, so far from May to July or May to August, we have only seen uh, inflows from uh, the FIIs. Uh, from a domestic mutual fund side, uh, generally they have been either very low inflows or redemptions. Uh, so to that extent, uh, one could say that the global liquidity has supported our economy and supported our markets, uh, while the domestic liquidity is sitting on the sidelines or booking profits and waiting for uh, things to become clearer. So I think that's a perfectly valid situation to be in, a perfectly good situation to be in from a domestic investor point of view, uh, that you are not now taking as much risk uh, by booking some profits. And I would think that, um, you know, if there is a correction of 5-10%, uh, which is always possible in equity markets at any point of time, and especially in times like these, uh, then uh, some of that, uh, some of those redemptions which were there, how that money which has gone out can come back in. So, so I think, and that will be a very healthy thing to happen because then um, investors would have booked profits and then re redeploying those profits at lower levels. And that will give more confidence for the longer term. So ultimately for the equity culture to get built in the country, it's important that, mm, it's important that investors uh, also uh, uh, be very disciplined in terms of how much they want to deploy in equities at what point of time, at what valuation. Uh, while you have a long-term horizon when you invest in equities of five, ten years, uh, sometimes it's not uh, uh, it's not a bad thing to always think in terms of what are the milestones, what are the valuations at which uh, you will slightly reduce your equity allocation and come back in with a higher equity allocation. So to that extent, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very healthy development. I would see that the investors are also thinking like that. For example, we have a product called Balanced Advantage Fund. And uh, that does exactly that on behalf of the investors. So 
the equity allocation there changes between 40% to 80%. Uh, so that's an ideal kind of range I would advise for uh, you know any any investor as well that you you know you you have your uh, parameters of valuation where you will reduce your equity and you come back in. Uh, obviously, at various points of time, on an average, you should have 50, 60 percent equity, but that doesn't mean you close your eyes to what is happening around you. Right, right, right. That, uh, you know, uh, takes me to the next question. So as a house, uh, across your actively uh, managed portfolios, uh, what is the, uh, you know, one trend, if you uh, were to call it, uh, across all portfolios that you have seen uh, from a perspective of adding few names or probably exiting out uh, due to, you know, COVID-related pandemic, uh, which is unfolding? Yeah, I cannot talk about stocks, but generally, uh from being overweight financials, we are now underweight. Uh, we are uh, overweight on pharma um, in a lot of our funds now as compared to earlier. Uh, even telecom, uh, we are overweight. We were always overweight, now we are more overweight. Um, and now I think with the trend which we are seeing is addition of more mid and small caps, even in the larger portfolios like multi cap or large and mid cap, or uh, you know even the larger funds we are seeing more uh, ideas being available in the mid and small and therefore that proportion is now going up. Okay, fair point. That you made. Uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, your opening remark when you said that uh, larger companies have the ability of the balance sheet and they have the strength of the balance sheet. The smaller companies, uh, you know, have the agility. Uh, talking about the smallest of the small companies, the startups, uh, how do you see that space evolving? Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, startups probably grappling for funding. There'll be supply side issues. Probably there are labor side issues as well. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, an average startup uh, evolving in the current uh, space? Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is uh, that over, uh, you know, probably a decade or so, Indian startup ecosystem has mushroomed uh, to a level and there have been a lot of government initiatives. Uh, probably you don't want to miss out on the uh, entrepreneurship uh, spirit that has just started to build up in India. And how do you see, uh, from a government perspective or from a policymaker's perspective, helping these startups probably survive and see light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I think uh, startups, as you rightly said, are uh, a big ecosystem now, and some of them have become. Uh, very valuable in terms of the valuations which they are getting. Um, I think for us, uh, for the government, obviously it is imperative to keep supporting them through various kind of initiatives. Um, for us as equity investors, we just have to, I mean, there's nothing we can, uh, I mean, I don't have a strong view on uh, startups therefore because I look at only the secondary markets, but as and when they come up for listing, obviously those are segments which we will uh, like to explore and support uh, as required. We, we have very few uh, listed e-commerce plays right now in India, uh, extremely few. So it will be a good thing uh, and it will be a good big sector which can emerge in the next three to five years as, as probably the next big sector which can become part of the Sensex and indices over the next five years. So it's, a, it's an exciting uh, period and also COVID has given these businesses some kind of a support or a you know boost, uh, which would have taken probably two years. What would have taken two years to happen in terms of consumer habits have happened now. So you practically cut between anywhere between 18 to 24 months in terms of changing consumer habits. And, and that's a big boost if some business can fast forward itself 18, 24 months because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. So it's, it'll be a, a segment worth watching, but you know, for us, for us uh, investors into listed markets, we, we'll have to wait when that happens. Interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, one final question before we wrap up, talking about the listed space, uh, oh, uh, you know, a few years we have seen uh, probably, you know, lackluster IPOs uh, uh, in, the, in the primary market. Uh, do you see this uh, as a temporary trend? Probably, you know, uh, back then in 2006-7, we used to have uh, some what, uh, uh, an IPO day probably. Uh, back then, and uh, uh, companies were getting listed. To have a you know thriving secondary market, 
uh, do you also see that opportunity from uh, the uh, you know company's perspective getting listed uh, more uh, you know uh, frequently? I mean, uh, more companies getting uh, listed frequently on the exchanges? Yeah, I think the pipeline is very strong. So if you have noticed in the last month and a half, uh, there have been some good, nice, interesting IPOs. And uh, from what I can see, the pipeline is pretty good, almost to the extent of uh, $10, 15000000000 billion. So as I said, we've already raised $33 billion this year, out of which I think 70% was QIP and the fresh issues were only about $9 billion. Uh, but that could change and that's changing. Uh, so, you know, a lot of businesses which were uh, IPO ready and had kept it on hold, uh, there is a pent up demand uh, or pent up supply of that which is hitting the markets. And, and I think, uh, so it's already changing. I mean, I won't see I don't, I won't like to see a IPO a day kind of situation because that is generally an indicator of a bubble, but uh, uh, definitely uh, one IPO per two weeks is not a bad uh, uh, pipeline to be looking at right now. Right, right, right. So there you have it, uh, you know, uh, from a market's perspective, from an economic perspective, probably we are in challenging times. And uh, as Rahul mentioned, there are, you know, quite a few pockets uh, within uh, the overall economy to look at uh, uh, from profiting from now on. And probably the mid caps and small caps are looking, uh, you know, attractive vis-a-vis -vis comparing them with the large cap. But of course, uh, as always, uh, please do consult uh, your financial advice before making any decisions uh, to invest and a quick disclaimer uh, mutual fund investments are not subject are subject to market risk and probably you know you should read all the scheme related documents before investing and uh, take a moment uh, to thank you Rahul uh, it was an engaging session with you uh, look forward to uh, such sessions uh, in a near future thank you thank you Nero.